Let's turn in our course books toward the back and sing this hymn, Take Me As I Am. Jesus, my Lord, to thee I cry, unless thou help me, I must die. Oh, bring thy free salvation nigh, and take me as I am. And take me as I am. And take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me. Oh, take me as I am. Helpless I am and full of dread. And yet for me thy blood was shed, and thou canst make me what thou wilt, and take me as I am, and take me as I am, and take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me, oh, take me as I am. No preparation can I make, my best results I only break. Yes, save me for thine own name's sake. And take me as I am, and take me as I am, and take me as I am. My only plea, Christ died for me, oh, take me as I am. Behold me, Savior, at thy feet. Deal with me as thou seest me. Thy work begin, thy work complete. And take me as I am. And take me as I am. And take me as I am. Thy only plea, Christ died for me. Oh, take me as I am. It's a great hymn. Let's sing number 11 and number 12, and then we'll get to our study for the day. Under the blood of Jesus, safe. In the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe in the shepherd's fold. Under the blood of Jesus, safe while the angels roll. Safe though the worlds may crumble. Safe though the skies grow dim, under the blood of Jesus, I am secure in Him. Did you hear what Jesus said to me? They're all taken away, away. Your sins are pardoned and you are free. They're all taken away. They're all taken away, away. They're all taken away, away. They're all taken away, away. My sins are all taken away. So I praise the Lord for sins forgiven. They're all taken away, away. While onward pressing. 
my way to heaven, they're all taken away. They're all taken away, away. They're all taken away, away. They're all taken away, away. My sins are all taken away. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to Proverbs chapter 20. I'm going to read from verse 13 down to verse 30. I want to speak with you about the difference between natural discernment and spiritual discernment. There is a natural discernment that the Lord has given his creatures. One might even relate it to instinct of what's right and wrong. The scriptures say that God has written his law on men's hearts to discern between good and evil. You might ask yourself, well, why is it then that that discernment isn't so evident? Well, there's a thing called sin. There's a thing called depravity that masks everything that God has put within us, mind and soul and body, in order to live in this world. It's called depravity. But there is a natural discernment which, with which even natural-minded people live and judge. And then there is spiritual discernment. Spiritual discernment is that which the Spirit of God gives, by which he directs the children of God. And I believe we have an example here in these instructions that are given in the book of Proverbs. It's for our good that these things are so. But without the Spirit of Christ, we are totally unable. That's what depravity is, total inability, unable to follow the instruction given you. We fall because we're fallen creatures, and that's where we need the Spirit of God. But as we read here in Proverbs 20, 13 to 30, I want you to think about with me the one spiritual man. Everybody talks about being a spiritual man. I want us to consider the one spiritual man that is Christ who came in the flesh, and because of our inability, he came to work out what we read here for our good. He did it, and did it to perfection, so that when any are considered to be the perfect man before God, a perfect woman, it's only in the perfect man, the one who came and fulfilled all this. And as we read these instructions here, given the Spirit of God and that discernment, we can see just what Christ did, what he accomplished. When he came to this earth, they saw a baby. Most people, they saw one who grew up. They saw a man, even called him the son of a carpenter. They, they saw the physical outward of him, but it takes spiritual eyes to see him as that God-man. And he didn't come to set the law aside. They accused him of doing that, but no, he said he came to fulfill it. So as we read this, everything in this, wherein we see our own depravity and inability, in him we see the fulfillment. Here in verse 13, I'll read down through these and then make some comments. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. It is not, it is not, saith the buyer, but when he is gone his way, then he boasteth. There is gold, a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Take his garment 
that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. Bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. Diverse weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. Man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy and after vows to make inquiry. A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. It is mysterious and beyond our understanding and comprehension left to ourselves. We would never even know to consider how all of these scriptures pertain to the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he accomplished on behalf of sinners such as we are. If in any way we were held to account for our salvation, even in the keeping of one of these proverbs, we would have to confess that we would be worthy of nothing but condemnation. Even as it's written, if a man keep the whole law, but disobey in one point, he's guilty of all. So we begin from that standpoint, acknowledging our guiltiness, acknowledging that in every one of these areas of clear instruction in word, we follow fail. But oh, the glory of knowing and seeing that in every one of these areas, not just in the letter, but the very spirit of it, your blessed Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, learned obedience. He came and worked it out on behalf of that people that you gave him to save, and therein is our joy. So oh, we pray for that spiritual discernment to see that it's not in us, but it's in Christ alone. I pray that you bless your word to our hearing and to our attention and understanding. Give your praise and glory and honor. In our dear Savior's name, amen. So as I was reading down through here, I don't know whether you picked up why the specific title with regard to natural and spiritual discernment. Where does discernment derive if it's not from the Lord? Even in the natural sense, you think about how the Lord has given certain wisdom to judges, for example, to be able to discern and lead a people. Parents of family, you observe certain parents that deal with their children and their discipline in, a, in what I would consider an honorable way, yet they're not necessarily the Lord's. They, they have a care for and a foresight. That's what discernment is, foresight. Why did any warn their children of certain dangers because of this discernment? It's natural. It's put within us. But it's faulty because coming from fallen creatures. But even that, one wouldn't have were not the Lord given it. For example, down here where it says in verse 24, man's goings are of the Lord. Notice the way that's put. That's true of his children. That's true of any of his creatures, man, humankind, his goings are of the Lord. In other words, the Lord directs even their steps and what they do. And how can a man then understand his own way? 
what I find interesting about all of these psychological self-help type things, they want people to figure out who they are, and they want to from there build a blueprint or plan to, to work out some kind of success. Well, how can a man understand his own way? Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? So it's just, in many ways, the blind trying to figure out life for themselves. But in it all, it's the Lord that directs the way. And then you look at verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. I believe this is talking about natural light that the Lord gives, because it's referring to a candle. A candle you don't take and light a whole city with, but within each creature, even though depraved, the Lord does give some light, some natural light, to be able to think and discern and reason. Even that is of the Lord. But it's like the, the Lord said to the Pharisees, if the light that be in you be darkness, how great is the darkness? It's just whatever light it is, it's natural light. There's not a soul that's ever going to discern God in how he's revealed himself even in these scriptures unless the Spirit of God, who is the author, gives the light of the knowledge of Christ that one. And therein is their hope. But the Spirit of man is the candle Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. Unconverted sinners, and you can think back to the day before the Lord first began a work of grace in your heart, you reasoned, you pondered. I'm sure even those of us that sat under the preaching of the word, we were pricked in our minds concerning certain things we read, but without the spirit of Christ, it's no better than someone out there in a remote place that's never heard the Bible read. The spirit of man is the can of the Lord, but it's still the Lord doing all things, directing all of his creatures. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes that God has put eternity in the heart of man. I don't care if the man or woman says they're an atheist. They still, by saying that, they're denying God. That's what they're doing. They've taken a stand against the God that they will not have to rule over them. But they still have to deal with it. They say an atheist or I'm an evolution. Well, Guess what? You can't escape the fact that you're God's creature and he's made you. And whatever hardening he leaves you in, he's just in condemning you. Because even the Lord gives them these thoughts. But the problem is they try to run the other way, cover it up. So in the instructions that we have here, we see the discernment that the Lord gives. And as I said, particularly how our Lord Jesus Christ would have exercised true discernment, true wisdom, true judgment. That word judgment means to discern. Just like with Solomon when he was faced, his first big challenge was with the woman that brought that child, or took a child, because hers she rolled over on in bed and smothered it. So now she took her sister's child and acted as if it was her own. And what, what did Solomon do? What was the discernment? He prayed for wisdom. What was the discernment God gave as a king? He said, bring a sword. I'll settle this. Let's cut the baby in half. Well, who is going to speak out against that? It's going to be the actual mother. Because the sister has already lost her child. So this would be a way to even it. Yeah, go ahead. Whereas the mother cried out, no. I'd rather that that child be raised by my, my sister than to see that child killed. And that's where Solomon knew immediately that that child, that baby, belonged to this other. That's wisdom. That's discernment that the Lord gives. But never a man ever exercised this true discernment like the Lord Jesus Christ. Take, for example, we'll go down through here, Proverbs 20 and verse 13, where it says, not to love sleep, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. In that our problem is that we would sleep the sleep of death 
not even caring for our own souls, and in the end come to that spiritual poverty, which would be our just desert, were it not for the Spirit of God awakening us. We talk about the work of the Spirit and heart as being an awakening. What it is is a bringing to life, lest we should come to poverty. In the sense of our own souls, in the end, find nothing but condemnation. When it says, open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. I love that comparison right there. Because to open the eyes is the work of the Spirit, and be satisfied with bread. Who's the bread but the bread of life? How is it that we have any hunger? A dead person doesn't have hunger. To hunger and thirst after righteousness is to hunger and thirst after that righteousness which God himself has ordained in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and approved. And therein we find his mercy. But this describes very clearly the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. I know as a man in the flesh, he became weary, he was tired, he slept. But he was ever conscious of the work that the Father gave him to do. And there wasn't any aspect of the law. as It was as if he didn't sleep. He meditated the law day and night, as Psalm 1 describes the blessed man. That's Christ. And why did he meditate it day and night? Why do we find him often throughout the entire night in prayer with his Father? I believe it was searching the scriptures and in every situation that God required of him perfect obedience, he worked that obedience. He was ever wakeful. Unlike his disciples, you remember, even in the garden on the eve of his crucifixion, they went with him there, and when he went a few paces and, and fell on his face before his father, what were they doing? Sleeping. That would be our case were it left up to us in any way to fulfill what's described here. Love not sleep. That's describing what we do by nature. And yet our Lord Jesus Christ was ever wakeful. And when it says open your eyes, that's something that we can't do ourselves. It takes the Spirit of God opening our eyes that we might be satisfied with bread. Christ was the bread of life. His eyes were ever open unto his Father's will to do all that was necessary that God might be just to justify sinners such as we are. It's describing here slothfulness. It's describing idleness. That's what we are by nature. That's why we see the command, love not sleep. We can't even endure even 20 minutes of sitting and listening to a message of the gospel other than sleepfulness takes hold. We become dull in our hearing and our thinking. And were that left to us then to fulfill, none of us could have any hope. But thankful for Christ's wakefulness, thankful that he never slumbered nor slept. In this sense, that in the end, that very righteousness that he came to work out, there's no appeal in any court of law that could ever find a loophole on behalf of those for whom he came. The second area of discernment is in verse 14. When someone says, it is not, it is not, said the buyer, but when, it, when he is gone, then he boasted. What is that but being deceived? How many times have, it says the buyer, how many times that you've gone to buy something from somebody and then you find out afterward that there was nothing to it? And uh, the one you bought it from, when he's on his way, he's chuckling, he's laughing. Years ago, we went with some friends to a some kind of fairground thing and they had some guys selling these four colored ink colors in one pen. And they went over and over again how this had a lifetime guarantee. And, and of course you get caught up in the 
atmosphere and everything, and they wanted five dollars for it. You know, if you buy it right now, it's five dollars. Otherwise, if you wait, you won't get it. And he had us believing that this was the latest and greatest thing that you could ever think of. You just want a different color. You just you shake this thing, and then you push the other one down. And it's all coming out of the same pen. And so we went ahead and bought one, and. Afterward, we came up with the, the saying, it's a real steal, because we realized we've been taken. I mean, even once we got the thing, by then the buyer's gone, and of course he's on his way boasting that he took some people. That's deception. But what is our nature in our depravity? Isn't it to be deceived? And... People love to have it so. In fact, they would rather be deceived even by these false preachers that come promoting certain things. And back when I was under this sort of preaching, it was how many people they got saved that day. They would boast of being able to sell somebody a bill of goods just to get a number, another notch in their belt. That's a porn. It's abominable. But such is our nature to be deceived. But herein we find our Lord Jesus Christ then, in no way was he ever deceived by any seller, by any that would purport to have a certain righteousness themselves, that went their way boasting of numbers that they were able to gather unto them, such as the Pharisee. Christ said of them, they crossed land and sea to make one proselyte, but that one proselyte then becomes twice fold the child of the devil. That's what false profession is. If you can get somebody to walk an aisle and say a prayer as a preacher or as a so-called witness, an evangelist, then you have doubly blinded that person. First of all, they've never seen their own sin. And they've been made to believe by following that person who's the seller their advice that somehow they've got something. So they're blind to their own depravity, but secondly, they're blind to whatever thought of righteousness they might need other than Christ. They find a, a self-assurance, if you will, in that decision. That I'll be all right. So they've got a false assurance. That's why they're twice told the child of the devil. But our Lord, when he came to this earth, he had the discernment to know what was true and false, especially when it came to the religious hucksters of his day. He called them merchandisers. If you want a good view of just how Christ himself saw and spoke of these deceivers of his day, because that's really what this is about, verse 14, deception. When they say, it is not, it is not, saith the buyer. That's what the buyer cries out once they realize that they've received something that really is worth nothing. It is not, it's not, said the buyer. But when he's gone his way, he boasted. They treat men's souls like a, a bargaining chip. That's all they do. That's all how they see it. And read Matthew chapter 23 that entire chapter, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, woe unto you. You wash the outside of the cup, but the inside is it's unclean. When you read that, and then you compare that to those of our day that consider themselves to be preachers of God, and people follow, they're deceived. There's bargaining going on. There's buying and selling with regard to holy things, but in the end, not to the satisfaction of God the Father. Our Lord Jesus Christ is the one that lived his life in this discernment, knowing truly the difference between good and evil and what men considered good, he called evil. What men considered evil, indeed, he declared to be good. What did they consider to be evil? They considered him to be evil. They, they, called him every name in the book. They spoke against that one righteousness that he came and earned and established that God approved. 
but many others continue their, their buying and selling like they do in religion today. There's a lot of money that exchanges hands today in the name of Christianity. They made it a, just like in Christ's day, the money changers in the temple. The people sold to bring a lamb as was required, and they would stand at the door and say, oh, well, that lamb won't do. You need to buy one of ours. And so they take that lamb and they give them, at a cost, another to go offer. And then what did they do with that lamb they just took away? They go back and put it in the fold, and the next guy comes along, well, here's a good lamb for you, this will work. That's what men do. They will deceive sinners with their bargaining, and yet it is evil. But thirdly, down here in verse 15, it says, There is gold and a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Here we see a picture of a stock of gold and of rubies. And when people look at that, again, the physical view of these things, they're impressed. That's why people are taken up with these modern places of worship and the more ornate that it can be the more impressed people are and they're attracted and drawn to these things that would be our case the physical just like when Christ with his disciples it's interesting there he is as the fulfillment of the temple of God and all of that gold and silver and precious stones that were built, used to build that, represented Christ in the flesh, Christ's attributes as the God-man in the flesh. And here the disciples are walking with Christ one day, observing the building, the adding on to the temple by Herod. This would have been the second temple that was rebuilt after the first had been destroyed by Babylon. And they were in essence, trying to impress our Lord with the beauty of these precious stones, not seeing that every one of those represented him. That's why he said to them, the day is coming when not one stone will remain upon another. To turn their eyes off of the physical, to him the spiritual. Destroy this temple in three days, I'll build it again. That was a statement that he made that the world of his day didn't understand. They thought he was going to destroy that physical temple. Well, he would, but it would be in A.D. 7, many years later. But he was speaking, John says, of his body, his death. So which is more precious, the gold, the silver, precious stone, or who it represents? That's why it says here, the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. This has to do with whose lips, who has knowledge. It has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And his word being precious, the lips of knowledge. Whatever comes out of these lips is tainted. But whatever the Lord speaks, therein is a precious jewel. So when we pray before we begin reading this word, or as we read it, that the Lord would be pleased to give us a word. We're recognizing that that word of Christ is the most vital thing. We can sit and learn all day long and study these scriptures and go away smarter if we think so. I learned some Proverbs today, and boy, I'm going to start working on some of that. Nope. If that's all we get coming out of this, then we have not heard the word. We're yet deaf to the one speaking. Now, the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. The lips of Christ are a precious jewel. Give me Christ or I die. Some can come and say, oh boy, you get into the word and you can excavate. And you get a lot of gold and silver and precious stones out of it. People are, people are fascinated with the word for the word's sake, but they've never heard the voice of the one that this word declares. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. That is precious. That is a precious jewel. All the other learning and everything we do is just, it's for naught, unless Christ himself be willing to speak. So you can see, again, the discernment that the Spirit gives, that even in reading these scriptures, perceiving it 
not just as Christ's word, but Christ himself. Wherever you read the word in scripture, put the name of Christ there, because that is how God is pleased to reveal himself to sinners. It's through the voice of Christ, Christ the word. When it says in the beginning was the word, in the beginning was Christ. Just automatically put his name there. And you can never go wrong. And oh, the joy. Talk about a precious jewel that's described here. When he opens your eyes to behold Christ, there's nothing else that's going to match to it. People come along with their little interpretations. I was clicking on the internet the other day, came across some, some quotes and sayings. And when you first start reading it, they're taking the same scripture that we look at and they're trying to draw out of it some kind of gold or some kind of silver, something precious for your life that today you can meditate on. It was a medit one little scripture meditation for each day. And it all was a way of trying to bolster up the one who was reading it to find some kind of help to get them through your day. What was missing had nothing to do with Christ. Many times when I see, and some friends of yours, acquaintances, will send you scriptures every once in a while that impress them. And sometimes you don't know what to do about it. You read it and you think, well, do I answer this or don't I? I think the best thing to do if you are going to answer is just say, I don't know with what purpose you sent me the scripture, but here's how the Lord has taught me from that scripture and point them to Christ. That's the precious jewel that the world ignores with all of their supposed gold, and rubies, and other things that, that they consider to be glistening. You can have all that, but if you don't have Christ, it's nothing. So the wisdom here, the discernment, to see how Christ is that precious jewel. And then, fourthly, down here in verse 16, where it says, take his garment that is a surety for a stranger, and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. When it says to take the garment of one who is a surety for a stranger, if you look in Exodus chapter 22, so all of this goes back to the law. And why was the law given? Well, it was given to reveal the very holy character of God and also to reveal our own depravity and sinfulness. But when it speaks here of taking the garment of one who's a surety for a stranger, in Exodus chapter 22, again, Scripture's its own best interpreter, here in verse 26 and 27, it says, If thou at all take thy neighbor's raiment to pledge, thou shalt deliver it unto him by that the sun goeth down. So if the neighbor promises to do something for you, and for whatever reason, by sundown, hasn't been able to fulfill it, you're not to keep that garment beyond sundown. For that is his covering only. It is his raiment for his skin. Wherein shall he sleep? The picture here is not obligating that neighbor beyond what he's able to fulfill and then holding it over him. I just think of how the Lord Jesus Christ has dealt with me as a sinner. He does not hold the law against me, even if by sundown I've not been able to fulfill it. I haven't. Thank God that Christ has taken whatever that obligation is and borne it himself and does not impute that to me for whatever reason. As if now... He's going to take it, and then he's going to obligate it of, of me as well. That would be double jeopardy. Either Christ has borne it, or he hasn't. So here the picture is that even in our obligations, the, the taking and holding of a pledge, that it not be beyond measure, and uh, that mercy be shown. It, it says there in the rest of the scripture, and it shall come to pass when he crieth unto me that I will hear, for I am gracious. 
So that's the picture that we have here, a picture of God's graciousness, even in the face of our own inabilities. Not that he just looks the other way, but he does not impute that sin unto us, wherein it has been imputed to the Savior. Once the Savior has taken that obligation on himself, then that obligation no longer belongs to the one under the obligation. It says, and hold it as a pledge when it is for a strange woman. That would be an adulteress. And what it's stating there is that even the idea there, a strange woman is a foreigner. That what applies within the company of Israel also applies to one that might be considered a strange woman. And some think, well, because it's a strange woman, then I can be more forceful in requiring more of them than, than I would of one of my own. And, and the point here is that it's the same. Take his garment that is surety for a stranger, take a pledge of him for a strange woman, but don't require more of that strange woman, that stranger would be the way to read it, than you would one of your own community. When I stop and think about, it, again, how the Lord has dealt with me, were he to require of us any part of the law and demand of us more of one than the other, that would be unjust. However, the Lord is pleased to deal. And you can see the whole purpose of it is that when that person, whatever you've taken from them, gets to a point where they realize, I cannot fulfill this obligation. And they cry out, the Lord says, be gracious. Be gracious. That's not in our nature to do. We tend to like to have people under our thumb. And so if they owe me something, boy, you're going to pay. And I stop and think, well, what if the Lord should deal with me in that matter? How, how could I respond if in any way he held me accountable to any part of his law, which I was not able to fulfill? Again, you come back to what the scriptures state. If a man obeyed the entire law and disobeyed one point, he's guilty of all. So how the Lord dealt with me? Again, here we see the discernment of God, we see the spiritual discernment that he gives to see that what Christ did, he came and took on himself that which I owed. And he fulfilled it entirely before the Father. And does not then in any way obligate me, this could be seen in the sense of Jew or Gentile. It says take his garment uh, that is surety for a stranger. That's who we are, strangers alienated from the life of God. And for a strange woman, a foreigner, that I would be held to account in a, a more strict manner than somebody else. Now, if that were the case, who could stand? If the Lord should mark iniquity, who should stand? But here the Lord gives us, here's that spiritual discernment, seeing how he has taken and become that surety himself. He is that surety that answers to every demand of God's holy law. That if God should require in any way that of me, I would be undone. And so, once again, we can see how the Lord Jesus Christ, rather than requiring of me something as the surety, he himself, God has sent to be that surety. And uh, the glorious good news is when the Spirit of God gives you eyes to see and behold the bread, be satisfied with the bread to see that Christ is that surety, and therefore I am safe. We're going to have to stop there. There's so much more in here. I read the entire portion to give us the, the context, but Lord willing, we'll come back to this next time. Again, see how... If this was the law by which we should live, even this small portion right here, if, if we were just to separate it out and say, okay, just live by this, who could stand? But sadly, that's how a lot of preachers are telling people to do. Just take a portion and, and work on that. Let's just work on staying awake. How's that working for you? 
We can make all the re resolutions we want to, but it's for naught because we know this flesh. It cannot be anything in this flesh that's going to bring satisfaction to the Holy God. I thank God. Again, go back and read this and see how the Lord Jesus Christ answered every one of these demands. of God's law and justice. That God might be just and justified, declared righteous, sinners such as we are. That's When I read this, I, I remember a day when I'd read these types of scriptures with with distress because I'm, I'm thinking, you know, this is far too great for me to bear, but I guess I got to do it, so here we are. Until the Lord, by His grace, shows you, no, it's, it's not there for you to do it. Like, that's why the law entered in, that every mouth might be stopped, and the whole world found guilty before Him. That what? We might, just like the one that had to give a garment for a shirt, that at the end of the day has to cry out for mercy. And the Lord says, I'm gracious. He gives the cry. He brings us to the end of ourselves. He gives us the cry and then grants the grace because of Christ. Well, I hope that's helpful. All right, we'll meet back here in a little bit and pray for the Lord's blessing while we've heard.